Good. Okay. Thank you for showing up this afternoon. I know it is after lunch on the second and last day. So sometimes I'm a little tentative about is anybody actually going to show up. So you guys are all on my Christmas card list from, uh, from this point on. I appreciate that. Uh, to get started, security governance. Uh, let me ask, if you don't mind, for my own edification, how many of you were at the short sessions this morning? Okay, okay, half. So I do have to change some of my humor and some of my material. So we'll try to be fresh for you this time around. Although I promise you we'll hear some repeats as well because some of it is relevant data. Security governance, as I usually explain, and it's also the other surprise that I usually get in doing this presentation that people actually do show up, is governance, is security governance especially, is typically not what is considered a sexy topic, right? <laughs> You're not gonna go in that hallway over there and start looking for vendors offering the latest security governance approach, are you? Right? Security governance is not bright and shiny. But what I usually warn all of my, all of my clients, and I've been doing this for quite some time, is that uh, it is probably the most important thing you will ever do to ensure the security or to ensure the, ensure the success of your security program. Let's do the flip side. It is the most important thing you will not do to ensure the failure of your security program. And so we need to pay attention to it. And uh, what I'm going to do here today, so I think everybody know who's, knows who Gartner is? Maybe. Research and advisory, blah, 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 right? All right. Uh, this, however, this presentation from Gartner is not theory. It is not based on research. Or more to the point, it is based on field research. I work on the consulting side of the house along with the team of, the, team of folks. I, am the, I run the public sector security practice for Gartner, which means I don't have a personal life. I fly all over the country doing state and local government all over the place. The good news here is that while this topic may not be sexy, it is based on fact. It is based on the results of hundreds and hundreds of security assessments that Gartner has conducted over the past six years all over the United States and indeed a little bit north of the border, our brothers in Canada, and a few out of Western Europe, but all public sector. We wanna show you the results because we believe that our results show that we can make a strong tie between weaknesses in governance and weaknesses in security overall. When I ask folks to think about security governance, one of the first things that a lot of folks think about and what probably makes it not sexy is this thought comes to mind, that governance is that pain point, beating people over the head with the big stick. And one of our recent findings is that, uh, for the most part, departments and agencies in states, cities, and counties, uh, et cetera, anybody from Louisiana? So I can leave out Parish. I don't have to mention Parish. Okay, good. Uh, for folks that are in government entities, for a long time, governance has met, it meant hitting people over the head with a compliance stick, right? And so we think of pain. That's what I think about. So my background, where do I get my painful memories? My background, in case you ha haven't, didn't read the bio or those types of things, I spent almost 30 years at NASA. 20 of those years, I was the chief information security officer for the space shuttle program. I can spell FISMA backwards. I can do NIST standing on my head, and I hate both of them. So that, I am on my soapbox now to tell you all about how we should get away from compliance standards. And we're gonna tell you how we're gonna try to do that, right? And what the best approaches are. And then there's a little bit of uh, a practicality here at the end that I will share with you here shortly. But we talk about uh, 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 governance being painful. The other one, the other aspect, if I ask you, first thought out of your head when I mention the word security governance is probably that one, right? Yawn, especially after lunch, right? Yeah. Did you guys actually eat the sandwiches or did you go out to lunch? Okay, cool, cool. 
So we have that one, all right? So those are the two perspectives that I typically see when I talk to people about security governance. Now, what are we gonna to try to do here over the next 30 or 40 minutes? I, wanna, I do actually have some things I want you to take out of here, all right? Four questions. If you can answer these four questions to your satisfaction, not mine, to yours, this, is what, this will have been a successful day. First of all, am I comfortable with our current approach? As I told the folks in the morning session, this answer will be different based on who you are talking to. Your financial person will say they are comfortable with your security approach, the less you spend. The business folks, as I, or as I refer to them, the pointy end of the spear of your organization, the guys that actually execute the mission of your department or your agency, service the citizens, they will be comfortable with your approach if you're not in their way and you're not an obstacle to them getting work done. Or more to the point that they don't have to remember 15 character passwords. You will be, you as, uh, everybody in here a security professional or are you members of management? Yeah, yeah all, well, all of the above? Okay, cool. I, I lived up multiple hats much of my career too. Us as security professionals, our goal is usually to build the 20 foot wall with concertina wire on top and patrolled by killer drones. Those are the things and the different various perspectives that exist that make us uh, wonder what really means comfort when it comes to security. We'll talk a little bit about that. Is it meeting my needs or my boss's? One of the findings out of our hundreds and hundreds of assessments is that there is this great chasm between security folks, and the pointy end of the business spear, right? And we need, we need to make sure that we close that so that when we talk about needs, they are one and the same. The trap that we security professionals fall into is that we start doing security for security's sake, not for business sake. Right? We need to change that mindset. So change starts by changing yourself, right? You guys have heard that before. You guys didn't know this was gonna be a motivational talk, did you? Okay. It's not. Are we doing the necessary things, right? Once upon a time, again, compliance was supposed to be the answer to necessary things. What we have found over time, and I think that you have experienced as well, is that it is not all of the necessary things. It is necessary things from a standpoint of someone that had a certain objective to achieve, and they gave you the list of rules that you should follow. Compliance is not security or more to the point, more appropriately, compliance doesn't mean you're not secured. Compliance just means you're not comprehensively secure. So what we need to do is when we move away from compliance is to establish a framework that helps us cover the waterfront. And when I say cover the waterfront, go back to number two, commensurate with business objectives. Again, I'll give you a more, little more specificity here in just a few minutes. Last but not least, my favorite, my personal favorite, are we inadvertently limiting our success by limiting our security approach to a compliance framework? Absolutely. Right? Compliance is almost, what do you think drives people's perception of us as being the office of no? It's typically compliance drivers. Oh, I got a rule here that says you can't do that. You can't do that. Now, come on, you can't get in the way of business, right? Business has to be conducted, there have to be exceptions. It's your job to find the mitigating controls or the substantial uh, uh, approvals that you will need from senior management to allow those things to happen to achieve the business objectives. Remember, you're not employed to make security work really well. You're employed to make security work for the business. Let's keep that in mind. Okay. Now. Whether you saw me this morning or not, right, I know that some of you are sitting out there going, yeah, man, I think I know this guy. I've seen him before, but I can't place it. Right? Well, a couple of disclaimers here. First of all, I am not this guy. <laughs> Nor am I that guy. Right? I am not this guy. And although some people say that my presentation style rep uh, is represented by my, my last colleague, I am not that guy. <laughs> okay, so get that out of your mind. Uh, we, I, I do try to inject a little humor. One of the things I first started, two things I learned when I first started public speaking many years ago. Number one is people te tend to retain more if they are entertained. So that's why the humor. 
Right? It's not making light of a very difficult, uh, hard subject, but it is trying to make sure you leave here with at least one thing you can put in your job. The other one is you retain more if I talk really fast. Why? Because your brain has to think faster to keep up with me. And you tend, the studies have shown you tend to retain more. So we're going to do both. We're going to laugh and I'm going to talk really fast. Yeah. Save your questions to the end, okay? All right, what is governance? So I got a couple of definitions here just to get everybody kind of on the same page. Right? Uh, various and sundry sources. You can see my favorite at the bottom, right? Of course you do. Of course Gartner has a definition. Gartner is everything IT, including security. Right? So a couple of definitions of governance. Now, what are we really going to talk about in here? Right? On the right side, security governance exists to ensure that the program meets the needs of the organization. Again, we don't do security for security's sake. Security management implements the program. I know we use these words interchangeably between management and governance a lot. They are tied together, but they are not the same. And then, of course, last but not least, security operations is, are the folks that actually do the work. Right? They run the wires. They pound on the keyboards. Right? Those are the folks that do the work. We always talk about the separation of governance and operations for exactly that reason, because more mature organizations we have found over time actually move security governance out of the IT organization. And you end up belonging to legal counsel or uh, the, uh, C the, your equivalent of a CFO, those types of things. But we didn't need to talk about right, that right now. This is, these will be the definitions that we will use for the remainder of today's session. A couple of things about governance that I have learned in my career. All right. Anybody read that, that book some time ago about everything I learned about life? I learned in kindergarten. All right. So we have Bob's immutable truths of security. These are things that I believe I have learned in my 30 some odd years of doing this work. First of all, on the left side, traditional security risk management. Remember the title for this little session, this little get together we're having here. Always seats in the front, in the front row. Isn't that always the way it works? Nothing in the back. Right. Traditional risk management, all right? I, anybody here want to argue that, that this is the way we've always done business, that this is what the expectations of us as security professionals has always been? Right. Typically, this is what we see, right? What we want to try to do, though, as I've been said several times now, facilitate internal business conditions, and we're going to talk about how to do that here in a few minutes, and then transform, again, you're going to hear this. This is the old college professor. When you hear it over and over again, more than three times, you know it's going to be on the test. So the test is going to ask you, what should be your goal for security? Is it security or is it the business? It's the business. Now, the immutable truths. First of all, most security governance failures are not technology related. If you go out in the hallway, you'll see all of my technology buddies out there, and I know most of them. All right? And there are a lot of really cool things. And I'm going to talk about technology somewhat extensively here shortly. But our findings in these hundreds and hundreds of assessments that we've done over the past five or six years is that fully two thirds, 65% of everything, every finding we have has nothing to do with technology. It's a process problem. It's not even a policy problem. People actually have policies a lot these days. Right? It's the enforcement of those policies through appropriate procedures, and then enforcement of those procedures through technology. Right? Sixty-five percent security programs. You know, the office of no. Everybody's got that part, right? We tend to be viewed as controllers and not facilitators. So I told you my background is with NASA. Uh, I went to work. Any, anybody? Everybody? Anybody see Apollo 13? Okay. There was a gentleman in there. His name was Gene Kranz. Name ring, ring a bell? Failure is not an option. Crew cut, white vest that his wife made for him. Right? He used to live down the street from me. Then I went to work for him. Right? So when we started being, when I first started the security program, sensitive but unclassified security program for the space shuttle program, I got to be a controller. I got to be the office of no. Why? Because the person backing me up, the head of the space shuttle program, was this big hulking guy named Gene Kranz. And Gene went, you will listen to Bob. And so Bob could say no and got away with it. Okay, cool stuff. Your job's not so easy anymore. 
Whether you have a big hulking boss behind you backing you up, that's not what we should be doing anymore. We, we can't facilitate the business that way anymore. Right? And one of the examples almost in reverse is uh, I took over the program and we started launching space shuttles back in the early 80s. Yes, that's how old I am. My entire career at NASA was nothing but space shuttles. And we started flying space shuttles. Well, a couple of months or a couple of years after we started flying our first couple of missions, guess what appeared on the runway in Vladivostok, Russia? An exact copy of a space shuttle. Seen by satellites. The shape is unmistakable. What we didn't know at the time was it couldn't fly. It had no engines. Why? Because they had not been able to get the information related to the propulsion systems. So it was just a big, dumb copy. A couple of weeks later, I had a couple of folks from the NSA come into my office, along with the head of NASA security, all of NASA security. And they said, Bob, said when we started the space shuttle program, we wanted this to be the public program, all of the information out in the public domain. We've rethought that. But now that it's all out there, how do I protect it? How much would it cost you, Bob, to go out there and protect all that information? I went, oh, holy cow. So we came up, $50 million. And they went, OK, Bob, how about we just protect everything from now on? <laughs> so that's what we did, right? But the bottom line was here, again, in reverse order, you know, we were trying to facilitate you know, collaboration by pushing something out there that it was inappropriate to do. So there are the right times to do no, and there are not the right times to do no, and that's what we're trying to get away from. The facilitation approach, ensure that processes are consistent, repeatable, and comprehensive, and ensure processes are commensurate with organizational culture and risk. Here's my bottom line. Of course, it'll be on the bottom of the chart, okay? does not have to be excessively formal, painful, burdensome. Here's the deal. And I work with a number of colleagues, one of whom is in this room, who's actually, you know, ITIL certified, all that kind of fun stuff. We all know how formal processes work. The way we view it, though, is formal processes, especially frameworks, are nothing but a toolbox. You pull out the right tool to do the job commensurate with how your organization wants to do it. So one of the first things we do in every one of these assessments that Gartner does is we talk to senior management. What's important to senior management? How much risk tolerance do they have? You know? So here's one of our findings. If you work for an agency or a department who's actually run by an elected official, they will say all the right stuff out in, in public, but when I get them in the back office, the answer to that question, what's most important to you, keep me and my organization off the front page of the newspaper or website. Yep. That's the most important thing, but it has to be, it is commensurate with their business objective. They have to be accomplishing something to get brownie points so they can move up the chain and become governor someday, right? But they don't want that negative press. So what we do is we use the right tool to make sure that within that risk tolerance, those risk tolerance parameters, and what my organization is trying to do. If you work, how many healthcare agencies and departments in here? All right, thank you, sir, thank you. Law enforcement, none? Uh, financial data, retirement systems, anything? Oh, of course, all the financial people are in here. Okay, very good, all right. You have to look at what's important. What are you trying to protect, and what are you trying to serve, and pick the right controls. Again, moving away from somebody telling you, you gotta do this set, but maybe you only need to do that set. Right. And we'll tell you how to argue with your auditors. Any auditors in the audience? Attorneys? Ah, oh, of course, dang. I, can't, I have to leave out some really good jokes now. Okay. All right, excuse me? Attorney <laughs> Yes, they're also not, usually not good for mixed company, but we'll leave, we'll leave that in there. Okay, one of the things, so I told you that this presentation would be based uh, on our findings, and we were able to aggregate our findings and tell you what the top four things are that we see wrong with security programs and security governance all across the country, right? You'll recognize most of them, 
Maybe nobody's ever actually just said them to you, but you'll recognize most of them. First one, we have a limited knowledge on how much is actually being spent on security. Why is that? Because security is usually not identified as a discipline in and of itself. What's it buried in? The IT budget, exactly. Right? I happen to know, if you were reading the newspapers here in California back in April, that that was one of the things the legislature beat everybody up about. How much are we spending on security? But you know why they asked that question? It wasn't because they had a bigger stick than you. It's because you were submitting budget requests for funding, and they didn't know how to prioritize them. Because they didn't know what you were already spending or what anybody else was already spending. So your $8 million request, would it, was it as important, more important, or less important than your sister organization's $200,000 request? They didn't know how to do that. I've talked to another, the legislative budget board in another state, and they told me, hey, Bob, we finally get it. We're doing security planning, we're doing security assessments, we're getting all of these requests from these agencies and departments. We finally get it. We've got to give these folks some money so they can do their jobs. Problem is, we can't give everybody everything they're asking for. But the problem that the, or, or the issue that they had was the agencies and departments couldn't answer one question. If I only give you a part of what you're asking for, what can you actually get done? And one of our problems was it was an all or nothing kind of thing. Right? And so what we have been trying to do, first of all, obviously we need to break out of IT. Right? And one of the result of not, again, not knowing how much uh, we're spending is we can't help the people that are giving us our money do the prioritization. Right? That's an important thing. If you want something, you've got to build the business case. Building the business case requires you to know how much you're, built, you're uh, uh, focusing on spending. I will tell you that later this year, California Department of Technology, based on recent legislation, will be coming out with a cost security specific cost collection framework that will ask you to follow that. How many people went to Scott McDonald's state CISO's presentation yesterday? He probably talked about this a little bit, right? It's coming out shortly. How do I know that? Gartner's partnering with CDT these days to help them get there, right? So, cost collection to help the state prioritize, to help you build appropriate roadmaps. Second item, limited perspective on overall security posture and level of risk exposure. Goes hand in hand with the first one because you can't prioritize simply based on dollar numbers alone. You have to prioritize on how much risk you have. Why do we not know our security posture? We lack periodic health checks of that security posture. And even if we have a health check, a lot of organizations that we run into in state government all across the country, they don't really have a central or a CISO that has authority to do anything about it. All they can go do is ask for money. They're not empowered. We've even run into entire states that do not have a California Department of Technology, a central IT organization. And so basically all the agencies are left on their own and they're not empowered to really do anything about it either other than to try to go get funding. So we don't know where our posture is and we, and we end up not being able to do anything about it. What's that result in? Inconsistent strategies or strategies not commensurate with what our business needs us to do. We end up focusing what little money we can get only on doing security for security's sake because somebody said you need monitoring or you need a firewall or you need endpoint protection, or you need multi-factor authentication. I've run into those legislative budget boards before, and they go, yeah, this agency asked for a firewall. We asked them why. They said, we don't know. Gardner told us to. No, not really. Gardner Research told us to. Right? The idea was there was no rationale behind it because they didn't know where their risks were. They had not taken their periodic health checks. Right? Third item, li limited strategic vision and planning horizons for the security program. So what does all that mean? It means we, we're not far, we don't look far enough down the road. One of our findings is that most organizations that we run into, and when I say most, probably 78, 80%, have a planning horizon of six to nine months. Why is that? 
consumed with tactical vulnerability management and compliance management, meaning we work to checklists. We have somebody run a scan and the scan comes back with findings and that's our security plan. Check the findings off, mitigate the findings. Somebody gives us a framework. What do we do? We focus on those compliance framework. Check them off, be done. Now the cool part is everybody wins, right? The boss goes, I need to be able to tell the governor that I'm taking care of security, fill this checklist out and get it right. You get, you get brownie points because you can do it quickly. Simple checklist, run a vulnerability scan, get your checklist, take care of them. Hey boss, I was done with this in a week. We're secure. Go report to the governor. Limited planning horizon. What does Gartner Research say to us about planning horizons? Should be three to four years. The reason for that is we, I, in the security assessments that we've done, we talk about security maturity. Very simply stated, how capable are you of defending yourself from the threat landscape versus how capable should you be defending yourself against the threat landscape. Gartner Research tells us that it typically takes, based on our studies, three to four years for an organization, especially a government organization, to incrementally change their security maturity. So we talk about three to four year security plans, security roadmaps, or the NIST buzzword, plan of action and milestones. Everybody got that one, right? Yeah, okay. So that's what we talk about on that one. What's the result again? Lack of defense in depth security architecture. Why? Because I'm gonna step out of the frame for a minute. Because we are consumed with tactics. We're not looking at strategy. Last item on my list, limited visibility into weaknesses that are process related, not technology. I mentioned that a little while ago. Because again, we are focusing on short term vulnerability assessments and technical mitigations. I'll probably say this again here in a few minutes, but one of the number one questions that I get from clients that I work with is, Bob, what is the latest threat? What is the latest attack vector that you're seeing going on? And what technology can I buy to stop it? And what do I ask them? I ask them, have you done the fundamentals yet? And they'll go, yeah, we got, you know, we got a firewall or two. Yeah, we got endpoint, uh, but we don't have it all. Nobody needs it all. I'm going, then I'm not gonna tell you what the latest attack vector is or the technology that you need. Why? Because why are you gonna spend all that money to, to lock the windows when the front door is still open? Okay. Fundamentals first, and then grow to where you need to be. And that's one of the problems we see about compliance. I'm gonna show you the scary chart here in a minute of the aggregated results, the aggregate results of all of the assessments that we've done over the years. And you can see for yourself in what a poor state the states are in. Result, limited confidence, and that's this, the last, I saved the, less, the, the best for last always. The last box, limited confidence that users, applications and devices and the infrastructure can maintain my security protection objectives. Commensurate with what? Business objectives, right? I don't have the warm fuzzy feeling that I know that if I don't have those things going on, if I have limited visibility, I have limited strategic vision, I have limited perspective on my posture, I don't have the warm fuzzy feeling that we're doing what we need to do. First question I asked earlier, right? Am I comfortable with my approach? Probably not. Okay, this is the infamous Gertner maturity model spider diagram, but it focuses on one topic. Governance, from a Gardner Research def uh, perspective, definition standpoint, you can see the perspectives of governance that go into having a sound security governance program. Those are the scores aggregated from our hundreds and hundreds of assessments. This is just about governance. I'm gonna show you the bigger security architecture picture here in a minute, but this is simply about governance. And you can see, now what's the due diligence line? Okay, it's kind of self-explanatory, but you've heard the word over and over again, basic security hygiene. This is what we call due diligence. If you are not due diligent, you are what? 
Thank you, sir. See, I, I thought the attorneys would answer that one first. That's usually an attorney question. All right. Yes, sir. You are negligent. And that's what we try to impress. If you're not doing everything fundamental, the little green line, then don't bother locking the windows because they're just going to walk through. So from a governance perspective, you can see all the different, different items up there. I am going to walk you around rel relatively quickly, walk you around each of the points on my little diagram here and give you a little bit of insight about what we're seeing and perhaps what we should be doing, the direction we should be going. A little bit of additional detail, and then you can see, no, planning and budgeting, policy and procedure, you can see these are almost due diligent. I said a little while ago, folks usually do have policies. There is some planning and budgeting going on, although I'm, I'm guessing everybody in here will uh, probably acknowledge that we're not getting all the funding we need, right? But the idea is the process is going on. Now, anybody can tell me why those two processes might actually be diligent? Because we've been doing them the longest. We've been doing them forever. You're going to see my next diagram, my next spider diagram here in a minute, and there are only going to be two items on that one that are due diligent. One has to do with malware and one has to do with physical security. Why? We've been doing them forever. How many remember the I love you virus? Nobody wants to admit to being old? Uh, I understand. I get it. Right? We've been doing those things a long time. We actually have gotten pretty good at some things, and that's the point here. But we're not very good at a lot of the other important items. All right, let's walk around. Vulnerability management. I think everybody knows what this is. In our parlance, we believe this, frankly, is table stakes. If you aren't doing vulnerability management, you lose. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. You've got to do this stuff. If you're not getting funding to do this stuff, this is the first, one of the first priorities. I'm going to tell you what the second priority here is in a minute. I've got to keep throwing out teasers so you'll stay. I know it's getting late in the afternoon. Right. Vulnerability management. All right, risk assessment, measurement, and enforcement. All right, here's that word compliance again. All right. We get asked over and over and over again, and I will tell you, Gartner turns down this type of work when I get asked to do a compliance assessment. Because really, if I do that, I'm not telling them the whole story. And they're going to go away thinking they're really good when they're really not. So Gartner turns down compliance assessments. We deal in strategy. We'll tell you how, how compliant you are as part of that strategy, but we go beyond that. But you can see here, it's intended as a measure of effective. That's the other key word I should have had underlined there, effective risk management. Okay. Process management. This is all about goals, right? Governance domains are necessary to categorize and guide interactions. One of the things, one of the, the couple of the best things that I get to do having been in this business so long, number one is I actually get to teach a couple of college courses, get to talk to college kids. Basically, it turns into a recruitment drive, right? Because I think everybody knows that one of the big industry problems that we have is not enough security skilled people to go around. I think the latest stat is 10,000 uh, openings by the unfilled openings by the end of this year, 100,000 by the end of the decade. Right? So it turns into a recruiting drive. But the other one is I get to mentor a lot of new CISOs. And I say CISOs, eh. Not that they're bad. It's as we have a term, my, my teammates and I have a term, they're 12 year olds. They're just out of college, they have no experience. The only thing that got them their job is they could spell security. Or perhaps they were the smartest network admin in the, in the, in the group. And somebody said, hey, you're used to securing things. You know, can you take it all on? So I actually get an opportunity to mentor a lot of these folks. Right? And one of the things I always tell them to do, we stepping out of the frame again, that word there. It is one thing to have a framework to guide what we do from an operational basis. It is another thing to actually be able to categorize things as they're coming at you 90 miles an hour from all different directions. And it's yet another thing still to be able to report all those thousands of things coming at you 90 miles an hour from all those different directions up the chain. And to make sure that the legislature and the governor don't keep sending me nasty grams or sending my boss nasty grams. Talked about the boss's needs. The boss's needs is not to get those nasty grams. When I worked at NASA, I used to actually 
based performance bonuses to my employees or their raises based on how much stuff they could keep out of my office. That's kind of the job, our job as CISOs, right? keeping stuff off the boss. One of the ways to do that is to have a solid framework, a high level framework that will help you categorize and guide the interactions. Planning and budgeting. Organizations, all right, so we heard a couple of things this morning. For those of you that came, went to the short session uh, keynotes early in the morning, we heard a couple of folks say we are starting to get more funding. And that's true. As I said, I've talked to a number of the state legislatures and their budget committees, and they say, we get it. We need to start handing out money. But we're not getting enough. In fact, we're a long way from getting enough. The average bill, when I go do a security assessment for an organization, the average bill that we find to, tell, to have an organization raise their security maturity level from where they are to where they need to be is between three and four million dollars. For a lot of smaller agencies, that's not good. For a lot of bigger agencies, they're thinking they got services to provide and they prioritize it over security. It's not a small, trivial amount. And so what we talk about is funding, and, and we're going to continue to be constrained due to lack of ability to prioritize those types of things, right? Because the business is always going to win when it comes to prioritizing only a few and scarce dollars. And so we have to have a way to handle that. I am going to give you at least one answer to that here in a few minutes. Organization. One of my second or third favorite questions that I usually get from folks is, where the heck should the CISO sit? Now, I know here in the state of California, they've actually legislatively mandated some of that. But one of the questions is, where should it sit? And I tell them, leave them alone. Right? If your program's working, don't fix it. There is no right answer. All right, now, generally, 90% across the country, CISOs and ISOs still belong to IT. But there is no real right answer if the program is working. And the reason I say that is I talked a little bit earlier about the office of no. And you'll see here another comment here in a minute about ISOs needing to be influencers, not edictors. Right? I have seen more security programs succeed based on simply the character, integrity, strength, personality, able to tell good jokes and war stories. I don't know. Call it whatever you want. I have seen more security programs succeed based on a positive ISO character than I have as to where the ISO has been stuck in the organization. I myself, when I first started in NASA, was buried way down at the bottom of an organization. One tiny organization as part of a giant program. And over time, they started to realize that it was bigger than that. And we were able to grow it. So let it grow itself and don't focus on getting the organization right, focus on getting the position right and what the job responsibilities are and putting someone there in there that can do it and hopefully not a 12 year old. Next item, policy and procedure. Again, up, there's my comment, influence and inform business decision makers and build relationships with people that can influence change. So here's the key, you write a policy, policy says you can't do these things, what's your job? to go convince the business that follow this rule or bad things will happen to you. Not follow this rule because I said so. Follow this rule because your business process will fail if you don't. In our, in, in our assessments, one of our findings is typically have a security management plan. What is that security management plan supposed to do? It's supposed to describe your overall security program. And as part of that program, you're actually supposed to define all of the business processes in your organization and tell where your security policies apply in each step of the business process. So think about why I said that for a minute. Take your business leadership. Their job is to provide citizens the services that your organization is responsible for. How are they supposed to know when to encrypt data, use strong passwords, or use weak passwords. How are they supposed, to, if they're responsible for developing software, how are they supposed to know how to secure it? Usually they go, that's an IT problem, I don't have to worry about it. It's not an IT problem, it's actually a business problem. You're just supposed to facilitate their effort. Next item, monitoring and response. Okay, here's one of the, one of the other key points. People report metrics, and they are metrics that absolutely you need to gather, but it's only for internal security management. 
Things like how many systems are patched, how many vulnerabilities have we identified, how many weaknesses did we have and that we have closed, and how much effort did it take. Those are all cool things. As the director or a, a manager of a department, you need to know those things so you can manage your workforce and your workload. But the business leadership and the senior management of your organization don't give a flying hoot. It doesn't tell them what value you as the security organization are actually providing to keeping them off the front page keeping them out of the headlines, making their business process successful, making sure that there are not riots in the street because citizens aren't getting their allocated benefits. Right? That, those are the types of things we need to talk about when we report security metrics. It is one of the holy grails, if I can use that word, because if you look at me and say, Bob, how, how do we do that? I'm going to go, I don't really know. Actually, I do. We talk about key risk indicators and key performance indicators. You've heard those words before. The mistake that we as security professionals make, we think key performance indicators means security performance, when really it's business performance and then what the risk indicators are that apply to that. If you can map that, again, going back to your business processes, documented in your security management plan, the risk indicators will fall out, then you'll know what to measure. But they're going to be different for every organization based on culture, tolerance, those types of things we talked about earlier. So again, get out of the business of reporting security for security's sake. Get into the business of reporting security as to the value that it provides the organization. Next item, program management and framework. Objectives versus controls. Compliance drives us to be control oriented to implement controls and to try to manage our program by controls. What are you really trying to do when, if you manage by controls? I'm a consultant, I get to use cliches, you get to herd cats. All you're trying to do if you're managing by controls is get all the cats running in the same direction. That's not what we're doing here. What we need to do is to layer objectives, business objectives on top of our control frameworks. Think of it like this. If I want to manage down to protecting my business environments, I work with controls. But if I want to report up those cool metrics, get the governor to see how good I'm doing, thank you, get the governor to see how good I'm doing, all those kind of things, you want to layer that management framework on top. That's that categorization thing I talked about a little bit earlier. Okay, my Mickey Mouse watch tells me that we're starting to run a little shorter time so we'll pick it up just a bit communication and awareness again back to the influence and inform we can't be stuck in our office this is the good old mbwa everybody those of you in my generation know that term management by walking around right this is communicating with the business again the value of security and the importance of security in the business perspective that's how you become a leader. That's how you make that program successful, even if you're not giving, given organizational authority, is then you work with the business leaders to be, gain credibility. Architecture management, basic blocking and tackling. This is the thing that I mentioned earlier. If you're not doing the fundamentals, don't worry about the bright and shiny objects. It won't do you any good. Many of the assessments that we have been on, we look in the little closet, and there's all kinds of unopened security hardware in there. Why? Because they can't figure out how to use it. They don't have the people to use it. They don't know why it should fit into their architecture. Why did they get it? Why did they spend the money? It's called end of year funding. <laughs> use it or lose it, right? So they bought something. And then don't forget the hidden risks, all right? Hidden risk. This is the point when all the cameras come out so they can take a picture of the slide. All right, I love it. They should stand in the middle. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, uh, protection, don't forget about the hidden risks. We talk about our security architecture and, our, and the businesses, all these hidden risks, supply chain, your system development life cycle, those things contain risks as well. In a comprehensive security program, these are the areas where compliance frameworks typically fall down and fail. Compliance frameworks seldom have cloud requirements. They seldom have SDLC requirements in them, or at least enforceable ones. These are the things we need to manage to. All right, I promised you, based on governance, what the picture looked like in security architecture maturity. So the spider diagram has changed. If you notice the topics all around the side, 
right? This is what a security architecture looks like as defined by Gartner. All the, this is that categorization framework that gets layered on top of a controls framework. It helps you deal and report and hope folks understand what's going on in your environment. Yes, what's the black line? That is the aggregate results of that so-called hundreds and hundreds of assessments that we've done over the past five or six years. And you can see almost to a point that we are below the line. Nowhere in the country or few places in the country are we diligent. And you can see, we believe that it's because of those four things I mentioned earlier from a governance perspective. I do have a couple of trends here, not that we're gonna talk about them much, but what we see, what I mean by trends are, we, you can obviously see a lot and a lot of weaknesses all across the security architecture, but the trend areas is where we see exactly the same thing wrong time after time after time. Just one, for example, application security. We have great functional developers, software developers, but they don't know how to build security into there. They don't do secure coding practices, no code assurance processes, right? That's just one. I'll leave the rest of the trends for some other time because I did want to get to this one. All right, this is the final answer. Gardner has this six principles of security resilience. We talk about business outcomes, again, We've already been to, I'm going to tell you what I was going to tell you, I told you, and now I'm going to remind you what I just told you, right? Good rule of public speaking. Coordinate and lead the business. They don't understand security. You, it's your job to learn the business and help them understand security and how security helps them achieve their goals, not your goals. Establish target objectives. That's that key goal, establishing objectives. Not, I want to put the 12 character passwords in place, but I want to ensure remote access is protected appropriately. Set objectives. Understanding information flow. Again, this goes back to learning the business. How does information flow throughout your organization and what are the touch points that where it needs to be protected? But the key point is that second paragraph in that bullet allow for exceptions. There is an exception to everything. I know some people will fall over dead, right? but there is an exception, a business-driven exception probably for everything. You need to be prepared to deal with that. What compensating control would you require to allow some policy violation to occur in the best interest of the business? Like letting executives use iPads and stuff like that. Yeah, that's all everybody's favorite, right? Facilitation, again, collaboration and communication, influence, not edict, should be your mantra. Influence, not edict. Be that communicator, be that influencer. Risk-based approach. So the cool part here, again, get away from the controls framework. Control frameworks are fine for your toolbox, but they're not fine for managing and reporting. So what we do is we have, we, we take our frameworks, we modify them to, the, to suit our culture and our needs, Right? And that's what we report to, that, that, that higher level categorization. Detecting and responding, again, this goes back to the metrics. How well are we doing? I used to be able to report to my NASA management that we were blocking 98% of your email. And in the 90s, everybody thought that was a way cool metric, that we were really protected because of that. Same, th same metric you can report today, but now nobody cares. Everybody knows that. Metrics not for the value of security, but for the value security provides to the business objectives. And last but not least, people focus. Here's that answer. Gartner Research still says an aware end user community is the number one security countermeasure you can possibly have. If your budgets are slashed, do security awareness training and then do the planning for when you start getting more money. I think with that, she saved me from showing me the one minute sign, so I, I appreciate that. So with that, I, the last thing I have to say, I mentioned it a little bit earlier as a little bit of a teaser. So Gartner is indeed partnering with the California Department of Technology along with OES, CMD, and California Highway Patrol to actually roll out a lot of what we just talked about. Talking about, I think you all know, you have the SAM, it's based on NIST, that's your controls toolbox. But what, we're, what CDT wants to do is to roll out a framework, a more understandable, simpler framework 
of objectives for agencies to manage to. Right now, you're managing to one objective, be compliant. We're going to roll out a framework of actual security objectives that we should target and measure to, and then we're going to have a reporting framework on top of that that will help the legislature and the governor understand that you really are trying. You know, it, it's not just about compliance. We are making an effort. What, what I, where I've seen that really work well, it, again, it goes back to funding. If they understand security and where the big weaknesses are, they are prepared to provide funding to address justifiable weaknesses. And when we can show them a spider diagram that has a big dip in it, where our maturity is very low, our ability to defend ourselves is very low, it is these days quite feasible to request money and legislatures are providing funding to close those gaps. And if we can show a statewide view, we can show individual agencies, that's what we're after with this new framework that we're working with CDT to be rolled out here in the near term. If you did not see Scott McDonald's, the current C state CISO uh, presentation yesterday, he talked a little bit about this and we are moving down that path for near term implementation. So stay tuned to an email near you. With that, I will, uh, I did not leave time for questions. I used up every single minute I possibly could, but if you would like to ask a question, I'll hang around outside in the hallway for a few minutes, okay? Thank you.